friends and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining me today. I am delighted to be reviewing The Prisoner of Azkaban by JK Rowling. This is one of my absolute favorite books in general. This and Goblet of Fire are my two favorite of the Harry Potter series and so like I said I'm so excited to be reviewing it. I promise I will do my best to keep this a reasonable length, but I could literally talk about this book for hours, but I will do my best. So I have my hot chocolate because as this book has taught us, chocolate is the cure for despair. Fact. Thank you Lupin for confirming our theories. So while I do my skincare, quick summary. It's Prisoner of Azkaban follows the pattern of the Harry Potter series starting out at the end of the summer near Harry's birthday and then continuing on through the entirety of the school year. Harry of course has been locked away all summer because the Dursleys are terrible people and they find out that there is an escaped convict from Azkaban which is the wizarding prison. His name is Sirius Black. He is considered highly incredibly dangerous and so the entire wizarding world is on high alert because no one has ever escaped from Azkaban before and he was supposedly one of Voldemort's top-notch supporters and just everything is really crazy and everyone's really worried about Harry because they think he's after Harry. So all of this crazy stuff with Sirius Black is going on and Dementors who are these terrible ghosty dark creatures who suck all the happiness out of you. They are guarding Hogwarts now. So Harry is trying to muddle through the whole school year with the threat of Sirius Black on the loose, Dementors guarding the castle, and the general trials of being a 13 year old regardless of whether you have magic or not. So all that happens, there's a new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor named Remus Lupin who seems to somehow be connected to Harry's past even though he's not quite sure how. That's pretty much it. From here on out there will definitely be spoilers. So if that is a bother to you, just heads up. If you don't care, then I guess it doesn't matter. So we will continue. I love this book so much. It, to me, it's just, it's the perfect balance for the Harry Potter series of the coziness and comfort and home and loveliness and magic of the wizarding world combined with just enough, you know, philosophy and real world applications and darkness. You know, the conflict of the rides of Voldemort and all these, all these tensions that Harry has to deal with. And in this book specifically, he deals a lot with the loss of his family because when the Dementors affect him, they really affect Harry. And so this book deals a lot with despair and memory and things like that. More than not all the other books, but it, this is the first time it's dealt with significantly because when the Dementors affect him, he, he actually hears his parents' voices right as they were about to die, as they sacrificed themselves for it. On the one hand, yeah, that's a traumatic memory. It's terrible for him to realize. But on the other hand, this is the only time he's ever remembered hearing his parents' voice. And so there's just something, there's like this bitter sweetness to it. And I'm kind of starting to cry thinking about it, but it's just like, so, you know, when you've lost someone, you understand that bitter sweetness just it's hard it's hard to explain how much like those last few memories you have and you know Harry Harry's a little different because his parents died when he was a kid but those last few memories that you have with someone that you've lost are so precious but they're so bittersweet at the same time because you remember the pain and the loss but at the same time they're so precious because those are the last moments you have and so for Harry he goes through that same thing of realizing he has those memories and it's terrible but at the same time he wants to keep hearing his parents voice and it's just it's it's a lot so he has to kind of go through that whole grieving process <laughs> and I think it's just pretty powerful sorry I'm already crying so we'll see how I <laughs> we'll see how on earth I get through this book for this makeup look I am going to be doing Patronus inspired makeup which oh I wanted to so I've hidden my Patronus somewhere on my bookshelf. <laughs> Can you guess what it is? Since I literally just put it up there. Have fun guessing what my Patronus is, according to Pottermore, which I think is a faulty Patronus judging system, but we'll get to that later. So like I said, I think this is just, it's one of the Harry Potter books that I think just has the best balance. This is one of the first books where you really see the injustice of the wizarding world. Obviously you have everything that happened with Sirius, you know, he didn't even really get a true trial. They just kind of, they took what they saw with Sirius and just kind of went with that and then sent him off to Azkaban. They did the same thing like with Hagrid in Chamber of Secrets where he just sent off to Azkaban with like no proof. What 
boggles my mind about the wizarding world and its justice system is they literally have truth potions. Umbridge uses them in the fifth book, which, I mean, we'll get to the fifth book when we get to the fifth book, but like, they literally have truth potions. All, all that would have had to have happened is Sirius could have just like requested, hey, can I use the truth potion? And then they would know that he's telling the truth. And I don't know, it just seems so ridiculous to me. I mean, obviously wrongful convictions would probably still happen at some point, but like the wizarding world has this huge advantage that the muggle world does not, but they're just kind of idiots about it. They just are kind of like, oh, well, we're magic, so we just know the right thing. Da, 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 da. This this book does a really interesting job, and it continues from here on out, of dealing with a corrupt government, or a government that is in the process of being corrupted. And I mean, from, from the Golden Trio's point of view, they can't do anything about it, really, because they're kids. So, you know, I think a lot of kids today really strongly feel that frustration with not being able to feel like they have a voice, like they have power, like they're able to do anything. They're just kind of riding these waves that are forged by adults. And as a kid, that's tough. Like I remember before I was an adult, before I was able to vote, do anything like that, I remember being really frustrated that, you know, I couldn't change anything, that I couldn't do anything, and I felt like I didn't have a voice. And for a lot of these wizarding kids, you see them slowly start to feel the same way that they they know there's things that are unfair in their society and they feel like they're unable to do anything about it and they try, there's still that level of unfairness. I think it's good to kind of have a book series that deals with that, but I, I think it's important to give kids that feeling of agency, that they do have a voice. And again, it's not dealt with as much as it is maybe in the later books, but I think this one strikes a particularly good balance because it's, start with this. That was the first thing. The other thing is, I love how this book deals with trauma and despair. I think that, you know, you get a lot of knowledge from Lupin. You know, he is someone that has been shunned his entire life. He has gone through a heck of a lot. And, you know, he, he tries to change his situation. He tries to be kind, to be loving, to be a good teacher. He is widely heralded by his students as the best DA teacher they've ever had. And you know, there are some things that he can't control. He can't control the fact that he is a werewolf. Spoiler alert, Remus is a werewolf. He can't control the fact that he turns every full moon. One of the things that I think is the prime example of this is the Bogger lesson, which is one of my absolute favorite, favorite, favorite scenes in just all of Harry Potter. I love the atmosphere of it. I love the kids facing their fears with laughter and determination. I love the little bit of philosophy that's mixed in with it. I love Remus really connecting with his students and teaching them and, you know, just taking that taking that time to be you know, to be there for them. I, I talk a lot about teaching in these videos, but I mean, it's out of school, so what else am I gonna do? At the moment, I'm, like I said, like I've said before, I'm working in the school system. Between the books and, you know, my own personal experience, I see just how dramatic an effect a good teacher versus a bad teacher can have, and I feel like Remus does a world of good to his students just by being a good teacher, and I think one bad teacher can do a lot of harm, but I think the effects of one good teacher can reverse a lot of that. Of course, I've mentioned that Neville is one of my favorite characters. I love his story arc, I love his growth throughout the books, throughout the series, and I love the Boggart scene. I love Remus's interaction with Neville because at the very start of the scene, Snape is there. He pounds Neville into dirt. He's like, you better you better watch out for Neville because he can't do anything. You know, he's, he's useless. And Neville just looks like he wants to like sink into the floor and he's just like, you know, he has this chance with this new teacher and he's suddenly thinking that, you know, Snape is ruining it for him. And we, we learn that Snape is literally Neville's worst fear, which I think for any, any teacher to be literally someone's worst fear is a horrible thing. Like, I, I've already talked about how I, Snape, I think Snape is a horrible human being in a worse teacher. <laughs> Picks favorites, doesn't care about his students, uh, the whole nine yards of what not to do as a teacher. So. Neville's probably thinking his chances of a good experience with Remus are ruined. And then Remus comes along and he was like, I was actually hoping that Neville would be the first one to help me with my with my lesson. And that to me was just so powerful. Neville's panicking, but then 
Remus just takes him under wing and shows him how to defeat the Boggarts and shows him how to face his fears and I think that's one of the most powerful philosophies that JK Rowling put into her books. That simple one that if you find yourself in a dark and terrifying situation like the only way to really face your fears is not to stop being afraid. The opposite of fear is not necessarily courage. The opposite of fear is a sense of balance, a sense of peace and being able to find that center, that laughter, that determination to continue on despite your fears and I think the existence of the Boggarts and the existence of that lesson in the narrative just highlights that and then of course as the book continues on Harry continues to deal with that lesson. Harry continues to have to try and figure out how to deal with these dementors, how to deal with these deep-seated traumas and fears that he has as much as chocolate helps it doesn't solve everything and I think for me my favorite parts of the book are again those parts that deal with the fear that deal with the dementors and trauma and this may just be coming from my personal experience I have I have anxiety and that's been a struggle I've had for most of my teen years and you know even though it's a lot better now I remember as a teen that being such a significant struggle and even just a couple years ago when I was really bad when you're in the midst of fear when you're in the midst of dealing with all of these overwhelming things and you're getting conflicting sig signals from every path it just seems so overwhelming and it seems like there's absolutely nothing you can do but it just takes one person to come alongside you and teach you how to face your fears to teach you how to continue on despite the fact that the anxiety has not abated that's all it takes to me those are by far the most powerful scenes I love seeing it come full circle throughout the narrative even at the very beginning of the book so Harry is faced with the Grimm throughout a lot of the book the Grimm in Harry Potter is this very large dog that is a symbol of death. At the very beginning, um, Harry accidentally uh, balloons his aunt, well, uh, he balloons his aunt Marge, which is Uncle Dursley's sister. And he's like, well, I'm about to be expelled. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna just dash because there's nothing for me here anymore. So he goes out and he sees the Grimm in the street, terrifies him. He doesn't really know what the Grimm is, but then you see stuff about it later. And, you know, so he's dealing with this fear and then the Dementors show up and he's dealing with that fear and you know all of these all of these things and then he learns that Sirius Black was his parents best friend and betrayed them to Voldemort. He's dealing with all of that and then at the first Quidditch game there's this experience all the Dementors were attracted to all of the people and so there I think they said there were like 40 of them on the football f or the football field oh my gosh the Quidditch field so Harry being affected as profoundly as he is he passes out and he just he falls and that's when Harry decides he has to start you know learning how to make a Patronus and you know seeks help from Remus and everything and so when he first tries to make a Patronus he struggles because you know his fear is outweighing his serenity and his friendships it's kind of that you know that constant struggle we have between our despair and our contentment and our peace and so then it comes full circle so if you haven't read the book major spoilers so towards the end a lot of stuff goes down really fast this whole thing with Sirius Black there's so many red herrings again I, I think JK Rowling is really really good at her reveals I think that's one thing that she just excels at. Pretty much everything that we've learned about Sirius Black up until this point has been a red herring. Like up until this point you've been told all this stuff about well you know he has escaped to find Harry Potter and his sleepy whispered he is here he is here. Um, he was the Potter's best friend and then he betrayed them. He was their secret keeper. He was the one who was supposed to keep them safe from Voldemort and he betrayed them and all this stuff has been a dramatic red herring. So at the end of the book we find out that Sirius is an animagi who is a wizard who can turn into an animal. McGonagall can turn into a cat. Sirius can turn into a dog. So he, this giant black dog shows up who's the one that Harry's been seeing this whole time. <laughs> And he appears and he drags Ron under the Whomping Willow and they're like, oh my gosh. And so they follow him and they go to the Shrieking Shack, which is supposedly the most haunted house ever. Turns out it was built for Remus when he was a kid. So at this point we learn about the Marauders. So the Marauders were Remus, Sirius, James Potter, and a boy named Peter Pettigrew who was supposedly killed by Sirius Black after he betrayed the Potters. And so we find out 
that in fact Peter Pettigrew is not dead. Peter Pettigrew is the one who betrayed the Potters because at the very last second Sirius had convinced Peter to be the secret keeper because he knew that Voldemort would think to come after him. And it turns out Peter was the actual one who was the betrayer and all this all this crap goes down. Severus shows up at the Shrieking Shack and he misunderstands the whole situation and of course he's Severus so he so he's not gonna listen to reason because why would he? It turns out, like like I said, this whole thing has been a dramatic red herring. Sirius isn't actually guilty at all. He spent 12 years in Azkaban for a crime he didn't commit. And anyway, so Sirius recognized Peter Pettigrew and that's the reason he escaped because he knew Peter was alive and he was at school with Harry and he's like, he's gonna try and betray, he's gonna try and betray Harry again. And being Harry's godfather, he's like, I have to protect him. I have to protect him. And so he, he does his best to try and protect Harry in whatever way he can. There's actually like, you know, he they do their best and like then accidentally Remus didn't get his potion so he starts to transform and then everything, everything falls apart and then there's... So this is the book that I think is just, it's interesting because it deals with time travel. Just, just a little bit. So it started out because Harry used a time turner to get to all of her classes because she took pretty much every class she was allowed to take and had a ridiculous school schedule. That girl was about at breaking point. Like that girl was PhD student levels so of stressed out at 13. Crazy amount of stressed out for a child. But you know she's Hermione and she will do what she will do. And so all that, all that happens and at the very end of the book, you know, there's all this stuff and like, they end up using the time turner, so, which is basically just this little hourglass that Hermione can twist and everything, and she and Harry end up going back and they end up being the ones to save the day. That whole thing is so action-packed and so fun to read and so satisfying. It's just like, every time I read it, I'm just like, heck yeah, everything's going good. I'm so proud of them for, for doing that right. It's just, ugh, so satisfying. So the other place where we kind of see the injustice of the wizarding world comes in the trial of Buckbeak. So Hagrid at the very beginning of the school year he's promoted to the care of magical creatures teacher. His very first lesson he brings in these hippogriffs which are basically um, a mix between eagles and horses and they're really proud and really stubborn and Draco Malfoy goes the hippogriff on and for his trouble gets his arm gashed. So he plays it up and gets Buckbeak sent to trial for being a like a really dangerous creature. So this trial of Buckbeak is like happening throughout the entirety of the book. And so basically Harry, Ron, and Hermione are doing their best to help Hagrid with Buckbeak's trial because you know they're sure they can get him off because Malfoy was the one who was goading him on. But then Lucius Malfoy bribes the council or committee into condemning him to death. So that all happens and then they try to appeal but basically they bring the executioner to the appeal. So of course you know things are already being decided and Lucius Malfoy being present. One of the things that they do is when Harry and Hermione are doing all their wibbly wobbly timey wimey stuff they set Buckbeak free and Buckbeak being set free is actually the reason they're able to rescue Sirius from getting the Dementors kiss and everything like that. It's interesting in a kid's book to deal with things as fear as despair as traumatically losing parent I mean not like to deal with it in an emotional way to deal with the ramifications of an unjust system to deal with uh, corruption and bribery and all of the stuff in a way that's just kind of honest and you sense that unfairness so deeply that's one of the things that I think affects me most throughout the series is just how deeply I feel not just for the characters, but I feel the injustice of a certain situation. Like, when we get to book five, I am going to rant so much. <laughs> just fair warning. I, I'm already ranting in this book about how unfair Buckbeak's trial was, how unfair Sirius's thing was, and like, just ever, everything about it. Just, <clears throat> but I think it's good to deal with because these are... These are things that do happen in the modern world that you have to kind of come to grips with. And so this book really brings up a lot of these things in the context of a fictional story, but it still forces you to think about them and to, you know, and then to therefore do something about it. It's my first time using this foundation on my face, so I just got it on my boxy charm, so we're gonna see what happens. That does not dispense a lot of product. is full coverage. I don't know why I'm doing it like that. 
but I think it's I think it's perfect for those like preteen kids that are you know not only are they starting to like recognize some of the injustices or some of the things that they think are unfair in the world but they're starting to actually think about it they're starting to question they're starting to try and understand the world around them rather than just accept the world around them you know that's such an interesting age to be at and you see that in the characters as well you know Harry Ron and Hermione are all at that age too they're starting to question things they're starting to realize things around them aren't necessarily fair and even for even for kids like Harry that know the world isn't fair they were raised in a situation that isn't fair they're still starting to reach that point where they feel like they have agency where they feel that they can change something that they can do something that makes the world different and you know because they're wizards and because you know they're the protagonists of a book they can make a significant difference they do the right thing and it's just it's amazing now there are still injustices in the book. There are things that cannot be fixed very easily and <sighs> the situation of Remus Lupin will make me sad every dying time because he was widely recognized as one of the like one of the best defense against the art teachers they ever had and this poor man has been basically unable to get paying work his entire adult life. He is weary, he is worn, he is poor <laughs> and he cannot catch a break and so of course he's outed as a werewolf because Snape is butthurt and so he resigns and leaves you know he's just he's such a legitimately good person just a beautiful person but his situation isn't fair it's not fair that Snape outed him it's not fair that he is in a position that is that vulnerable and that stigmatized it's not fair that he has to go through life with this burden he didn't have to be bitten by a werewolf when he was like four years old he, you know there's things in life that won't end up fair and and so I think that this book has an interesting way of balancing those concepts there's some things that turn out really well there's some things like Buckbeak completely set free there's some things that turn out bittersweet serious He's free, he didn't have the Dementor's kiss, but he's still technically a wanted criminal. He wasn't exonerated because Peter Pettigrew escaped and there was no way to prove it was Snape's word and everyone else's word against the word of kids and that wasn't gonna cut it. And there's things that are just wholly unfair, like everything that happens with, with Remus. And I think it does a good job of balancing those. That's the basic gist of everything in the book. Now I'm just, while I finish up my look, I'm just going to talk about some moments that I loved. As I mentioned that this is one of my two favorites of the Harry Potter series, so there's really nothing in the book that I think is badly written other than the fact that I think the wizarding system of justice is stupid and it's just truly an enjoyable read, so I'm just going to spend the rest of the time talking about things that I love. <laughs> Deal with it. So I love that this book starts out with Harry getting his first ever birthday card it just warms my heart that's just right off the bat but it just warms my heart it makes me so happy just to know that he that he gets that at least like that he is starting to be loved and cared for and he knows it he knows that he is special and valuable to people and that just it makes me so happy <laughs> one thing i think it also does really well and this is kind of a side plot in the book but the fights and arguments between harry ron and hermione so one thing that a lot of teens obviously deal with is interpersonal conflict there's drama between friends i mean with harry ron and hermione it all kind of starts because hermione gets a cat named crookshanks who we later end up finding out ends up becoming friends with sirius and is trying to get scabbers because <laughs> Crookshanks is super smart and knows that scabbers is <laughs> no good but you know Ron just thinks that Hermione's cat is trying to eat his rat um and so they're just nasty to each other Harry's caught in the middle and everything just goes wrong and then towards the middle of the book Harry gets gifted a mysterious firebolt which is a super duper expensive top of the line broom and Hermione's like it was it was from Sirius Black he's probably trying to kill you and Ron and Harry are like like absolutely flabbergasted because Hermione turns it in and they don't speak to her for ages and ages and ages um and it turns out it wasn't Shanks but she was like but aren't you happy that it's you know but it's not ruined you can have it now I was right and you know it just causes this major rift between them to settle even more so all of this goes down throughout the entire book and it's only towards the end of the book where they kind of start to to make up and I love I love Hagrid because Hagrid points out like isn't your friendship more important like Hermione's super stressed she's super tired she's super worried about you and all you're doing is being terrible to her and they're like oh oh yeah I guess this is the first time I'm going to try powdering my under eye let's see how it goes look at me I'm trying to be a beauty youtuber I powder my under eye would y'all look at that anyway so <laughs> back to what I was saying I just think that that the 
depiction of their friendship is so realistic because it does have struggles. It's not perfect the entire time. They're, you know, they're kids. They're, they're going to have these stupid arguments, but I love that they have these adults in their life that are willing and able to help them no matter what. But like in the books, they do such a good job of making all of the three main characters, all of your characters really, just have legitimate real flaws. You know, they're not perfect characters and that's what makes characters relatable and feel real. That's why I get so passionate about my favorite characters and ah. The Marauders map makes its first appearance. I love everything we get to learn about the Marauders. I love hearing about their childhood, about, you know, their friendship, and again, these are kids, so they're gonna make mistakes, so yes, James and Sirius absolutely made mistakes. They were kind of troublemakers as kids. So all this, like, I love every little detail about the Marauders map and learning about the Marauders and obviously every little detail about Remus that we learned about him. I think it's interesting that every time Hermione is described as stressed out and tired, it's like the bags under her eyes were almost as big as Remus's, and like it, it makes the, like J.K. Rowling very specifically points out just how tired and weary and rough looking Sirius is. Like, like that boy has been through the ringer in his life. Okay, so other things that I love. So there's one moment in class where Snape, being the jerk bully that he is, calls Hermione a know-it-all, which, I mean, people call Hermione a know-it-all like once a week, but coming from a teacher, that's particularly hurtful. And so Ron has this, Ron has a couple lovely Gryffindor moments in this book. Uh, the first is this one where he stands up to Snape and he said, you asked us a question and she knows the answer. Why ask if you don't want to be told? He gets himself a detention for it, but he stands up for his friend and he points out Snape's jerkiness, basically. <laughs> and then the other one is, of course, when, you know, Ron, he has a broken leg, he's been dragged into the Whomping Willow. This is when they still think that Sirius is a serial killer that's trying to kill Harry. And Ron is standing up on a broken leg and says, if you want him, you'll have to go through me. Like, he's a 13-year-old kid with no wand. He's obviously not going to be much of a trouble for this deranged maniac. It's just such a lovely little moment. I love it so much. Again, I love seeing both Ron and Hermione have both weaknesses and strengths and moments where you're like, that's why they're in Gryffindor. And that's one of the moments where it's like, that's why he's in Gryffindor. That's why that boy is... You know, he's not just a side character that you can just say, well, he's, you know, whatever. Who cares? <laughs> like, he he deserves to be in Gryffindor. He's a good character. Don't, just my boy. <laughs> I mean, he's not, he's not one of my top three favorites, but I still love him. And I feel like people, I feel like people diss him too much. That is my official opinion. Ooh, that is more electric blue than I thought it was. Okay. I, I can't imagine what it would be like. Like, there's a couple moments where you kind of get a little bit of an end to what it'd be like to be a teacher at Hogwarts. Like, there's a little bit of a rivalry between Trelawney and McGonagall because, you know, McGonagall's, she's more of the scientist, she's all about facts, she's all about things that can be proven, and she's like, you know, Trelawney's very imprecise, whatever. <laughs> she predicts a student's death at least once a semester, you know, <laughs> all this stuff, and she's like... <laughs> be assured, if you die, you won't be required to turn in your homework. So that's more of like a friendly sort of thing. Whereas with Lupin and Snape, it's like they're kind of enemies. And I can't imagine what it'd be like to have to like literally have your coworker be your enemy, but you kind of get little glimpses here and there. And you know, Rue is such a sweet person. He's not going to be like inherently terrible to Snape, but at the same time, like he takes these little itty bitty moments to just kind of get some comeuppance. <laughs> I love it. So those are a few favorite moments. Ooh, I love little details, like the Quidditch matches. I love seeing Lee Jordan being the narrator and McGonagall like co-narrating. Just those little exchanges back and forth just are such, like I said, they just add so much richness to it. There's, there's no other way around it. It makes me happy. Everything about this book makes me happy, but it's just the richness of the details like those that I just love. Hermione slapping Malfoy over Hagrid is sweet justice. That is my official note. <clears throat> sweet justice. I feel like I look kind of wild right now without anything else on my face and just these like super bright blue eyes. I want to be as glowy as a Patronus. Patronus? I want to be as glowy as a Patronus. I don't know where the heck Patronus came from. 
Now I can speak English. I'm just putting powder highlight all over my face. Ha ha! Another moment they loved. Like, so they end up like knocking out Snape, like in the Shrieking Shack. And Hermione's first response is like, we attacked a teacher. We attacked a teacher! <laughs> she just freaks out and I'm like, I can't imagine the like cognitive dissonance this poor girl's going through because she's like the teacher's pet to end all teacher's pets. And she just like full on knocked out a teacher. Like even though it's a jerk teacher, like she still knocked out a teacher. <laughs> By the way, this was the highlighter I was using. I'm using another one. <laughs> gives Harry this brief hope like well I'm your godfather maybe you'll want to live with me and Harry's like not live with the Dursleys heck yeah because you know <laughs> Dursleys are terrible that just that just mo that moment is just so it's so good it's so good and you know of course it's, it's dashed just a little bit later but just for that brief moment it was kind of like oh you know maybe Harry will be able to have like a happy home life not really there's, there is a hopeful, a hopeful message at the end, you know. Even Sirius sends Harry a letter as they're on the train, and just with this cute little owl. And I love that everyone kind of gets their own little moment. Harry gets his Hogsmeade permission slip, and he's like, this should be good enough for Dumbledore, and da 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 da. Actually, the owl that he sent, you know, and he's like, Ron, since it's my fault, you no longer have rat. I thought you might like this owl. Like, I love that he thought of those little details. Like, Sirius is a character, you know, he does, he's not there a ton, but he's still, he's still an interesting character. You know, you think of this guy who's been wrongfully convicted for years, he's just got out of prison, and one of the first things he thinks of to do is, you know, he sends his godson this, like, crazy expensive broom. He makes sure he's able to go on field trips. He... He gives his godson's best friend an owl because he accidentally got rid of his pet. Just all these little, little things. It warms my cold blue heart. I love that one of the last things we get is Harry, like, taunting the Dursleys with his godfather's, like, murderer convicted status and using that to finagle his way into <laughs> just a little bit more freedom. <laughs> like, oh yeah, he'll be checking in with me, so... I want to make sure that you're behaving. So I'm going to really quickly do my lipstick and shut up as per usual. The applicator on these is so weird. Like I love the glosses but the applicator is so weird. Pretty much it, so I'm going to real quick just walk it all down. So a couple other things, and these are more just talking points. So if you want to talk about them in the comments, because like I, you know I have opinions on them, but I didn't want this to turn into like a whole video essay. And so of course after the book came out, J.K. Rowling mentioned that Lupin was kind of written to represent those with blood disorders that are stigmatized, such as HIV and AIDS, and a lot of people had very mixed feelings on this revelation, specifically since it was after the fact. You know, I did some research on it. I My own opinions are kind of mixed on whether or not this is a good representation of things like that. Obviously Lupin is one of my favorite characters, so he's near and dear to my heart, and so any controversy that is surrounding him as a character is just, it's interesting for me. Of course this is the final makeup look, the Patronus inspired. If you didn't catch on earlier, my Patronus is a dolphin. <laughs> According to Pottermore, so I, you know, I like, I like it. He's my little buddy. You know, I love dolphins. They're weird. They're intelligent. They're pack animals. They have the capacity to be both helpful and vindictive. They're good, weird little beings. So if you know what your Patronus is, I would also be extremely curious to hear that. So hopefully my Patronus makeup look does justice to this awesome concept, to this amazing book. I really hope that you have enjoyed 
our time together today. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to comment, like, and subscribe. You know, all those YouTuber-y things. This channel is just so much fun for me. It's just very stress relieving to be able to be creative with my makeup and to talk about books. So with that being said, that is where we are going to end today. Thank you so much for joining me. It has been an absolute pleasure. I hope you go on to have a beautiful day filled with joy and hope. Don't forget that chocolate day keeps the dementors away. <laughs> so thank you so much. I love you all very, very, very much. Goodbye.